Hi, this is George Weingroff, and give me back my pro wrestling. Promotional consideration paid for by the following. This is Steve Bowtie Bryant here. Back in the 90s, I was a pro wrestling photographer for the South, and I released what might have been one of the original sets of indie trading cards. I ran across some of these original sets. They were up in Randall Fanning's attic all this time. PG-13 rookie card, Ricky Morton, George Weingroff as the Sheep, Chris Champion, Reno Riggins, Billy Montana, Gary Valiant, the Scorpion, the Medic, Rick Reynolds, Jeff Daniels, Mephisto and Dante, Ben Jordan, Steve Neely, Marcus Woodrow, Clinton Charisma, Little Farmer John. If you'd like an opportunity to get these cards, contact me now. You can get them for only $49.99. Contact me at Steve Bowtie Bryant at iCloud.com. Get your set now while supplies last. Todd here from the Kayfabe Cave in Pulaski, Tennessee. On April 20th, 2024, from 12 noon to 3 p.m., the legendary Jimmy Golden will be in the house for a meet and greet. He will be in Bunkhouse Buck character as well for a great photo opportunity. For those of you who cannot make it in person, we will have a Facebook Live virtual signing from 3 to 4 p.m. Photo ops are $30. Autographed 8x10s or personal items are $30. A double autograph print of Jimmy and his other half, Bunkhouse Buck, is $40. We offer a combo which includes a photo op, autographed item of your choice, and an autographed event poster for $50. Don't miss this as Jimmy does not do many appearances anymore. This is a rare opportunity to meet a legend who has been in the ring with a you name them list of guys. For all updates and events, like and follow us on social media at the K-Fabe Cave. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome one more time to the Give Me Back, my pro wrestling podcast. And I'm here, as always, with my brother from the same father and mother, the Plastic Sheik, Jared Street. What's up, Sheik? How you doing, brother? I'm doing great, brother. How about yourself? Yeah, I'm doing well. Just, you know, doing the thing. We've had some fun stuff going on with the podcast. You know, we have a great guest today, Mr. George Weingroff, a shooter from way back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, hey, there's still something from, uh, I guess, Taylor Swift. Uh, I think you and Wolfie are in your uh, world class era. Yes. Right yeah, we definitely <laughs> are. Working with Captain's Corner Nick, he's hooked us up with a lot of these world class because he's got that upcoming signing down in yeah. Florida at the Rosen Center in Orlando. So if you're down that way around the 20th of April, make sure you stop by and see him and see all the stars of world class, man. It's very cool. Yeah. It's a good, it's a cool thing though, man. You get to hear a lot of stories and, uh, uh, you know, didn't get to see a lot of world class growing up, but I wish more of them had checked out the iron claw movie so I could actually hear what they actually think of it. Like the actual movie, a lot of them have had, you know, kind of negative opinions about it without actually having seen it. Right. Um, so right. I, w I wish, I wish they would, I don't know. I kind of wish they'd watched it so we could hear. Yeah. You know, and I think more what they think, but I, I know there was stuff left out, but yeah, that, I mean, I think the one thing is, is you'll hear that in the Brian Adias episode. Actually, he did see it. He actually saw it with Kevin at the premiere. Oh, that's, so that's cool. Though, at least. Yeah. 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 So, but you're right. But here's the tricky part with, with captain's corner, Nick down there in Florida, they're one of the discussion panels they're on is talking about the iron claw. So well, that's what I figured it would be. I think I'd heard that in the advertisement. So like, yeah. So we'll see. Right. But <laughs> it's yeah. not, it's not our problem, but yeah I, yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, it's still kind of embarrassing that I haven't seen it, but whatever, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just timing. A lot of times it was around Christmas and everything like that. So yeah. 
It is, you know, and, and I'll see it and I'll do a full report when I do, but yeah, I agree. And, but Brian had a really, you know, good perspective on it and y'all check out his episode that is out now on live and in color with Wolfie D. It's a good episode. He's, he's like a step Von Eric, like, you know, Tracy and the Armstrongs. So very cool. Yeah. But yeah, man, uh, you know, today we've got another, we've got another hit, man. We've got another great episode. I've been, you know, been promoting this one for a few weeks now, but you know, George has having different things happening with his health and stuff. And we wanted to make sure he was good before we got him on and, and he's great. And, and man, I, you know, I'm just excited to talk to him because really George is just, (laughs) he's, he's done a lot. He's been everywhere. It's like a lot of our guests. He's done all these things, but he's also got the stories to tell man. And, and the cool thing is, is with George, he's kind of like done all that, but he also has that connection with our Tennessee guys too, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's, he's, he's really, the perfect guest you know for us you know so i'm looking forward to it yeah well before we get to george we got to talk about the the elephant in the room right which is is wrestlemania the story was finished right absolutely man i thought they did a great job with the story um yeah you know you know you knew kind of i mean let's be honest it wasn't a big secret that the rock and roman were going to win on saturday night to make it bloodline rules basically right not anything goes and, and because that way uh your conquering hero had more to overcome um, right right you know the, the cameos i guess you'll say were were all pretty well timed out and uh all made sense i, I was kind of hoping for stone cold uh, <laughs> But you get Taker, you get Taker. I mean, how can you argue with Taker? Right. That that cool moment. But, uh, you know, to me, it would have made a little more sense because Stone Cold was such a big rival of The Rock, but maybe he didn't want to do it. So maybe that's it. Yeah. Maybe that's it. But but Taker, but Taker's never anything to sneeze about. So, no. And, you know, he was going to be there. And plus, I mean, you know, the Stone Cold and The Rock could have been a little more even. The, you know, The Undertaker could have gotten over on The Rock pretty quick. And then maybe, you know, then they would have had a match. But anyway, I I thought you can't really question how I guess you can. But, you know, our our little brother Mason, you know, was there. Very cool. Representing the podcast, man. He's he's got a. He's, yeah, definitely jealous. He's got a gimmick going right now, you know. He he represents the podcast at at major pay per views now. So yeah, we'll, we'll definitely you. take it. Yeah, we'll definitely take it. Thank you, Mason, very much. That was very cool to see the words us whatever the podcast in that arena with all those people. Man, that's pretty crazy. You know, that's oh that absolutely yeah, man. Very humbling, and thank you, Mason, for for showing us off, man. <laughs> next, next time, Mason, get the floor seats where those where that those people kept. Putting up their cut out heads of their self, I guess. Yes, yes. Do that one. I would uh, you get that seat next time, Mason. I, and then did you see the couple that was like there both nights or something? It was a man and a woman's head. And yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, they were like I mean, can you imagine what they spent on those tickets? Like well, can you imagine what been like sitting behind them? Oh my gosh, that would have been horrible. <laughs> like, yeah, we get it. You're on TV. Take it down. <laughs> you held it up for ten minutes now. Put it down. Yeah, just as all the things break out, like the, the yeah. Undertaker shows up and you miss it because that guy's got his head in the way. Yeah, that would be yeah. annoying. But yeah, it was a good. I thought it was overall good. Sami Zayn and Gun- Gunther was a great match. You know, a, a lot of title changes. They they definitely hit the reset button on some things. You know, I didn't expect to see Damian Priest, but I was thinking in my mind if he's gonna do it he needs to do it soon you know and well, it, and, and and honestly it's great storytelling to me because uh you don't have cm punk come right back and he's challenging mcintyre for the title and then you know potentially beating mcintyre for the title they can they can trade wins back and forth and yeah uh, and everything like that before they have to worry about the title and uh Right. That gives that gives Priest a little run. I don't expect Priest run to be long. I could be wrong. Right. But I don't expect it to be long. Um Yeah. You know, McIntyre's been doing some of the best character work of his of his time, I think. I mean <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, don't I, know, I agree. I don't know if there's real beef with him and CM Punk and that comes out in that or if it if it's just all just that good. I mean just, it's just real beef. Yeah. It makes sense. 
Yeah. I mean, just two dudes that are wanting the same goal, you know? So yeah. I think people are predicting maybe Cody and Punk at next year's Mania and then maybe, you know, The Rock and and Roman. But you never know. Who could, who knows? But I, I just didn't see a way that really Roman could blame The Rock for not, you know, like making it happen. But maybe he could just simply say, you said you're the final boss and I'm the, you know, you're whatever. Yeah. But who knows? I mean, Roman essentially cost himself the title when he focused on Seth with a chair, getting his revenge from the Shield days. Right. And, uh, so yeah. he, he, if he had used the chair on Cody, you got to figure he'd have won. But yeah. And if you guys are asking us why we don't cover AEW pay per views as much, it's because it's on Peacock. And <laughs> yeah, know. we 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 buy we pay Peacock, and we basically have like what do we cost for one pay per view a year if we had to buy every AEW pay per view? Exactly. Be a different story. It would be. It would be. And it would be. I yeah. would love to get AEW pay-per-views for this price. I mean. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Maybe one day. Who knows? Yeah, maybe so. I mean, I do think it's a smart model. If you can work with a, a streamer, that will make right. it work. But anyway, yeah. I think I, I give it. What would you say? What would you give the overall WrestleMania as a rating? I'd give Night 2 a solid A, A plus maybe. Night 1 probably a B. So if you look at overall, probably A. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it was like a B plus a for sure, you know, but yeah. I mean, there really wasn't many bad spots. I, I just, the, the Uso match didn't really do a lot for me. And, you and know, it should have done more. I think you know? it, it should have, but you know, it didn't. And I don't know. I mean, I liked them better as a tag team, I guess, you know, yeah, they're, yeah. we'll I see. Agree. I don't know. Is the bloodline over now? Is it continuing on with more people? Well, they're saying Jacob Fatu is signed with WWE yeah. now. I mean, and so, Tama Tonga is too. So yeah. So I mean, if those guys are coming in, I don't know. Maybe there's some new blood to be in the bloodline. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, speaking of bloodline, we've got somebody who's got a very strong bloodline today. Of course, his father was Gentleman Saul Weingroff, and for sure, the son and honestly, lifelong friend of Lanny Poffo and, and Randy Savage, George Weingroff, his own self, is on the show today. And I say, let's take a quick break and get him on. What do you say to that? Let's do it. All right, we'll be right back after these messages. Hey guys, this is Wolfie D from PG-13. Check out my podcast, Live and in Color with Wolfie D, every Monday at noon. We're talking Memphis, we're talking ECW, WCW, WWF, everywhere that I've been. We even have some great guests, some Hall of Famers on the show with us. Every Monday, Live and in Color with Wolfie D. That's right, it's the talk of Middle Tennessee, the channel you love to hate and the channel you hate to love. It's Brian Turner from Brian Turner's VHS Rehab. And if you're looking for matches from Wolfie D to Jerry Lawler to Dusty Rhodes and the team that put a pimp before your eyes and a goatee between your thighs, booty call on Athena, go to lostwrestling.com. See, I made it easy for you. Brian Turner's VHS Rehab. Booyah! This is Kroll, and you're listening to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling with Jimmy Street and Jared the Plastic Sheik. Be sure to like, subscribe, and view all of our USWO and Saw Wrestling content at Nashville Wrestling Network exclusively on YouTube. All right, we are back with a very special guest today. And Jared, we're just hits after hits after hits. Today is one of my favorite people that I've known since I met him. And honestly, anybody who knows this name knows it goes way back in wrestling. But if anybody hears this name, they know one thing. That dude is a shooter. And today we have him on our show. And I'm shooting about that. <laughs> is, is George Weingroff. How are you, sir? Thank you for coming on. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. Very Our pleasure. Cool. Our pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool to have you on. So first off, before we get started. Well, before, before you get started, can I give a little plug to my brother's um, website? It's called Memories of Gentleman Saul Weingroff. Yes. It's, it's really, really good. And there's a lot of pictures and stories on it. It's, um, it's Memories of Gentleman Saul Weingroff. Okay. My book. I love it. Herbie's doing it, right? Is that it? Yeah. But yeah, you, you know, you have to ask him to be a member 
and then people post stuff on it. Okay, very cool. Yeah, I, I, I think you, I think you should go. It's inter, it's really entertaining. I will definitely okay. do that. So we got that plug in, and let's go with this. How are you feeling, man? I know you had a little bit of health thing. Are you feeling good? No, I'm I'm doing great. Good, doing good. Great. I'm, yeah. I'm all cleared for any activity. Okay, yeah. even good. even uh, annoying podcast questions. <laughs> oh, no problem. Okay, all right, <laughs> all right. I, I, Jimmy, I've got a lot of stories, you know, and it's like um, I'm I'm grateful that I can tell it to some people, you know, because you know, they're just going to go by the wayside if I don't. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. That's that's the best way to say that. Honestly, George, I appreciate that. So we always start every episode off with the first question, and that's coming from, ironically, the plastic chic. So go ahead, chic, take it away. All right, George. So you've been around this business and. Your dad was in this business, but I, uh, a question I always like to ask is like, if you had a Mount Rushmore, like four or five wrestlers that you just love to watch or that, or that made you love wrestling or that you love to work with, whatever, uh, who would those be like a Mount Rushmore, four or five guys? Well, personally, I would start with uh, Randy Savage because oh, he, was, yeah. he was such a, he was such a good worker. He was such a, he was a pleasure. He wasn't too loose. He wasn't too stiff. Uh, you didn't have you didn't have to think, and I may have told you, Jimmy, before his. You know, I traveled. You know, we we started together, but that that's another long story. Um, <laughs> but but his philosophy was he wanted to have everybody's best match, whether it was a midget or it was Andre the Giant. Yeah. So he and he always you know tried to ha- give everybody a good match and also another philosophy he worked just as hard for a crowd with um 50 people as 5000 people he says you know they they paid their money they they deserve a good match don't sit on your butt yeah so, yeah he was really good about that that's awesome that's awesome to hear man that makes you that makes you respect him even more hearing that from you Oh yeah, uh, you know, got, 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 if there's not a good crowd, they'll just lay down and they don't care. You right. know, but that that wasn't him. He, yeah, he, don't penalize <laughs> the ones who came. Right. <laughs> exactly. That's what he would say. He, he had yeah. a good attitude. You know, he may have uh, you know, rubbed some people the wrong way, but he was good um, on on a lot of things. Um, I would have to say Rick, Rick Flair. I never worked with him. I was in dressing rooms, and I know a lot of people have negative things but he was always uh a gentleman to me he's the first one to come into the room and shake your hand invite you out to do something and he he always remembered you i thought he he was wearing a suit he was always class yeah yeah no doubt and the other one would be ronnie garvin Um, Mm. he had he had great ring presence. He got over just walking from the dressing room to the ring. You knew, you know, that this guy was tough and some and somebody special. Yeah, and yeah. You, know, you, you always felt like he could he could actually Kick beat up the guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wasn't just lollygagging to the ring, you know. And I mean, you just you, you knew he was tough. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Is that is that the ones you got? You got any? You got well, one? There was, uh, I I like this guy, um, Garo uh, Teneru in, in Japan. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. He was uh, a big guy. I think he was second in the Olympics, but he was tough. He yeah, was good. Carried Ten- himself. I was really impressed. There might be some more. I'll just have to think about it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a good no. list, though. That's an incredible yeah. Mount Rushmore. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And thank you for letting us meet Ronnie that day with me and Wolfie. So that was awesome. Right. Yeah, definitely appreciate you doing that. So it, we always pivot to this. And, and this is really where I'm interested. And, and if we talk all day about this, I'm fine. So tell us about your younger days, where you were born, high school, amateur wrestling. Talk about the early, early days of George Weingroff. Uh, my dad was on the road and I was born in, uh, Augusta, Georgia. And, and I grew up in day in Daytona beach. Okay. And back then my father, he had, uh, he had boxed. he was in the Navy. Okay. He, he boxed and he was a pitcher on, on a Navy baseball team. And he was on, a um, uh, a, a boat during the Korean conflict, but he never, you know, was in battle or anything. Gotcha. Um, and my fa- quickly, my father, um, my grandparents came over from, uh, Russia 
through uh, Germany, and they came through Ellis Island. And my father grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Wow. And he had to, he had to quit school when he was in eighth grade to help make the family some money. And he worked for an, in in a he was an apprentice for a man had a sign painting company. So he he learned you know from an early age how to be a sign painter. Um, and that's, that's where he made money. Uh, he started, um, later on through, through the boxing. He was good friends with, have you ever heard of Angelo Dundee? Was oh yeah. Ali's trainer. Yeah. He was good buddies with him. So, you know, he, he boxed some professionally and, uh, he then gradually he, 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 he met some wrestlers and, and, he, and he, that, that, that's how he got into the wrestling business. Very cool. Very cool. I grew up in Florida, so um, and this uh, all reminded me. Uh, I watched the other night the Eddie Graham uh, uh, Dark Side of the Ring or the Grams. Have you seen yeah, that? Yeah, I have. Yeah, very sad. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I my dad he had a they called the Beach Arena in Daytona Beach. And he opened up a sign shop in there, and then he, the main part of it, he had it. He had an arena, so he would run weekly shows, and he would uh, contract the wrestlers through Cowboy Lettrell. He was the guy they didn't even mention him before before Eddie Graham. So he he'd pay a, um, a booking fee to have them come. Mm. So I guess eventually Eddie, uh, you know, I think Cowboy fell ill and, and, and Eddie bought him out and started. So my, my dad was a pretty big personality with the, uh, Kurt and Carl Von Brauner in the, um, in Florida. Um, a side story. My dad pulled an angle with, um, Eddie Graham back in the day. You couldn't do it anymore. He, he and Eddie met on uh, a downtown street. And they had a fight, and the in the and the police arrested them, and they unbelievable pu- publicity on that, and uh, they actually went to court, and the judge wasn't happy about it, but you know, and my dad said, yeah, Eddie attacked him first, and Eddie said, my Saul attacked him. I was on the <laughs> side of the. Road. I think there's an article on it on on that um, memories the gentleman saw. It's, but they pulled a heck of an angle and they made a lot of money off that. That's you, awesome. You, 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 that stuff. Yeah. So uh, I think I'm about ten years old. Eddie Graham had a yeah. When I saw the show, it reminded me of Eddie Graham. He had a um. It was called Eddie Graham's All American Youth Camp. And, you know, you, you could go for a week or two during the summer. And I went and I had to cafe my name. I couldn't tell him, you know, I had to come up with another last name. Um, <laughs> but it, but it was, it was so cool as a kid, you know, they, we slept in a bunkhouse. We rode horses every day. We played archery. We went swimming. We went fishing. Um, That's and awesome. then the, the highlight was I don't know if you've heard of this guy, um, Coach John Heath. He would come in and they had a pavilion with a wrestling mat and and he taught wrestling. So so every day we'd have a an hour or so of wrestling. So I that was my first kind of introduction to amateur wrestling. Yeah. And and at this point your dad's in the business obviously. So are you liking pro wrestling as well as being an am- amateur? Well, I'm just, I'm just a Mark and I'm like, you know, uh, I know who Eddie Graham is and you know, he, he, he's the arch enemy and so forth. But you know, I just, I, <laughs> I, I, I just, play, I just played it cool. Yeah. I okay. remember, I remember Mike Graham coming around, but he had, he would just turn 16 and he had a Jeep, an open air Jeep and he'd come in, um, flying in there and he'd do uh, circles and mess up the grounds. And uh, I remember, Co- you know, I asked Coach Heath how come he wasn't here. And he said, oh, he, the kid's spoiled. <laughs> so I, I, just, I, I never met him. I just, I just saw how he was at, at yeah. that time. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, le- I learned my first moves there. 
Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And so obviously this is a, a, a very important part of your career, but also something that is just fact. So talk about how it was at that time, especially, you know, in that era growing up with a visual impairment, especially being such an incredible athlete that you are. Um, uh, wasn't long after my parents were, were divorced. So, uh, 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 my dad finished his run, I think with Eddie, you know, he, he'd been back and forth. He had a good run in, in Texas with, um, the funks and so forth. Um, so I would come up and visit my dad during the summers and he had a house that was near the Tennessee school for the blind. Okay. And okay. He, would you be interested? I said, hell no, I'm not interested. I want anything to do with that. So he kind of let it go. So one day we're going by and he said, let's just, it was in late July. It was hot. He said, let's just go, let's go take a look. So we went in there's, I didn't, we didn't think anybody was there. We walked down the hallway and uh, eventually it was the principal's office and uh, the principal and uh, Ralph Brewer, who was a teacher and a wrestling coach was there. So, uh, oh, they just jumped up and flipped when they saw my dad. And uh, <laughs> So the first thing uh, Ralph did was took me over to the gym and put me on the scale to see to see what I weighed and, and where, where he could fit me in. So, uh, you know, I, I like this personality, and that's like a, Ralph was a um, former Tennessee State High School wrestling champ, and he wrestled at Auburn. Okay, so okay. I was – this this was when I was in 10th grade. So yeah. I was very fortunate because um, he knew a lot. And a lot of the other wrestling coach in Nashville, they, they just didn't. So I got some really, really good coaching. Yeah. So that's, that, that's kind of how that got started. And did your dad know that already? Like he foresaw that and was like, he's going to like him. It's going to work out. Or was it just something oh. he was shot in the dark? It was it was a shot in the dark. They we 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 had no idea, um, but you know when I was wrestling in high school, I think I, uh, I lost two matches in three years. Wow! But, uh, my, my, <laughs> wow! My, my, and I actually um, got got revenge on both of them. But my <laughs> dad, um, he would he would miss work just to come to the uh, the dual meet. So we generally had them in the in the evenings and uh we 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 were drawing good crowds we had, we had a good team and he was he, he he was so proud you know that his son was doing well in wrestling yeah, uh, yeah. My, this my very first match we wrestled uh, um this school maplewood in um nashville yeah and it yeah. was so it was in the in the about one o'clock. It was one of the school. They 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 let everybody out to come to the wrestling match, or else you had to go to study hall. So there was yeah. probably probably fifteen hundred people or more in in the gym. It's my very first match. I don't have a clue. <laughs> so behind our um, chairs, our bench is my dad and Tojo Yamamoto, and on the far side is uh Lou Fez and Lynn Rossi. Wow. Um, and, and they've got paper people there. They've got um uh, a camera from one of the stations because it was a big meet, you know, and I'm like, wow. <laughs> so, uh, I I did win. I didn't know what I was doing, but I you know my um uh, my motivation was I wanted to make my father proud of me. I wanted to make my coach proud of me. And I just love getting that handshake and, you know, way, way to go, son. So that, yeah. that really yeah. uh, it motivated me in the, for, for the right reasons. No doubt. So, Absolutely. So I was able to overachieve. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then I go to, um, got a scholarship at UT Chattanooga, uh, this would be bragging. I turned down about, you know, Auburn, Tennessee, Georgia, LSU, um, Kentucky. I, I, I'm just trying to think, but my dad talked me in, into Chattanooga because it was close and he, and he could come watch. Yeah. Well, yeah. So yeah. That catapulted me into, into, um, you know, my, my amateur career. And then I got a teaching degree. I was a, um, high school teacher for about seven years in, in a wrestling coach and you're not going to make any money. It was a, and, <laughs> and I, and I had wrestled part time. Um, 
I, the first day I graduated from uh, college, I flew to Toledo to meet my dad, and I actually hooked up with with Randy Savage. He had just got out of baseball, you know. He he'd been let oh, go, yeah. so Randy and I hung out for the entire summer. Where we it was a great time. We would um, we we'd work out. We'd go to the gym. Um, we'd go to the University of Toledo. Another guy had a, had a key there, and we could you know we could work out. And we we would uh, mostly. We do amateur stuff, but we practice on um, how to how we would get in the ring, how you would take a take a bump, how you would carry yourself. So that was, you know, and we and we weren't booked a lot. That, you know, we were working for the Sheik. You know, we're just Randy probably weighed 160 pounds, <laughs> uh, but he was smart. He and his father told the Sheik that say uh, it was a fifty dollar guarantee. He told them he said if you'll book me more. You just got to pay me twenty five dollars. So, so, so he got booked more, but with the whole di- idea of he's going to get more experience. Right, yeah. right. And to know Randy taking a pay cut is not really something he ever did much after that. <laughs> well, he he, he he it wasn't the money he's living with his. It's just it's just getting right. the experience. Where right. where else you get it? Right. I'm, I just meant he turned into an incredible businessman as well. You know. So. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so George, take us back to college a little bit. Didn't you? Didn't you uh, meet uh, young Pez Watley there? Yes, I did. Um, Pez was a few years older than me, and um, Pez would always bug me and a few of the other guys about professional wrestling be, being not on the on the up and up. And he'd say, "Why don't you bring some of those guys down here?" And he just aggravated me to death. So, and I was. <laughs> I'd always say, no, nah, it's, it, it's for real. Those guys were good. So I get teased so quickly. A funny story. I got Pez hooked up with my dad, and he got trained, and he went to Oklahoma for his first uh, little little territory. And he was just gone a, um, a couple of months. So we got a big um, – Southern Open wrestling tournament, and he just he just happened to come in the gym, and um, I was on deck for a match. So I'm um, with this little guy, Bill Burnside, who was Pez's buddy, and they used to bug the crap out of me, right? Uh-huh. So, uh, Pez comes in, and he Bill knows. Oh, Pez is going to tell him the truth now. Oh, Pez, how you doing? You you went on a tour for wrestling. He says, "Well, George is here, so." Um, Tell us, tell us the truth. Is it fake? And Pez winks at me and looks over. He says, "You know what, Bill?" He says George was telling the truth. It's real. Bill goes, "Damn it, you son of a bitch! Did you have to take the oath too?" <laughs> <laughs> I always remind Bill that he did to take the oath too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god well then what led you to the special olympics in wrestling um i had taught um a year up at the indiana school for the blind and I, they, they would have national tournaments and that that was kind of a joke and then you know they had a a, a national tournament or a, a, a special Olympics for the, for the wrestling only rest visually impaired up in uh, Toronto. So I went to that and I, it's, it was, it was no big accomplishment. I'd wrestled tougher guys, you know? So yeah. Yeah. It, it, it looks good on paper. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Very cool. So tell us about, um, like, but like your, your first like pro match, your first pro wrestling match. Oh my God. This is a good story. <laughs> yeah, that's what um, want. I'm 15 years old. <laughs> my dad had smartened me up a, a week or so earlier. And, and I, I'm like, I, you know, well, I can understand some of the guys. And I said, but I tell you what, that Johnny Valentine, he's for real. I see him beat the shit out. He said, no, damn it. He's working too. You know, no. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen Johnny Valentine? Right. You can't do any of the. So anyway, he sends me, you know, who um, Ricky Morton is. Right? Oh, of course. Ricky. One of my so favorites. Dad, yeah. Yeah. His dad was Paul Morton. They called him Bald Eagle. He used to pull the ring and referee and wrestle some. Uh, so I go down to this little town 
with Paul. I'm I'm 15 years old. I helped him put up the ring. So um, it's a small gymnasium, an elementary school, and it's like it's in the middle of the summer, so it doesn't get. You'll, you'll see my point. It doesn't get uh, dark until about eight thirty or nine o'clock. Okay. Know? Yeah. So there's only one bathroom, and it's, it's that you got to go through the gym and down the hallway. So my dad gives me this his outfit, and I've got a red mask on, right? You know, because yeah. I'm just a kid, you know. Right. And it's, you right. Know? So uh, you know, I'm nervous. I got to pee and everything. So uh, my dad gets. I get the outfit. And I had some boots. They're really high, almost almost to your knee. With you know, that you got to um, lace it up real high. So I got my boots finally on, and um, scuffling hillbillies were in there. And um, he was going to referee the first match because I was going to wrestle Paul. So they look over at me and they say, "Hey, kid, you've got your shoes on the wrong feet." Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they were so I did not know. I'm nervous. I got to pee, you know, and I can't go out with the mask on, you know. So, so I start to unlace it, and ding, 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 the bell rings. <laughs> so I wrestled without Mary Paul Morton with my shoes on the wrong feet. <laughs> so I didn't have a. Paul Morton's doing all kinds kinds of stuff, and they're 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 buying everything. And finally, you know, I get to the dressing room and I take the mask off and I sneak out. And, I, and the point is, I couldn't sneak outside because it's still daylight. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so first, Rick, Ricky Morton loves that story. He had my the shoes on the wrong feet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, that's uh, funny. I, I made I, I made ten dollars. Yeah. Okay. And who and who was that for? Nick Goulas. Nick Goulas. But okay. I didn't I, I didn't care. Yeah. Um, so Corsica Joe, you ever heard that name? Oh yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. His wife Sarah McKay was mm -hmm. the wrestler. Too. Anyway, she had a son that wrestled for uh, another high school in Nashville, and she tells the coach, "Well, you know, can." Can you um, can you wrestle um, if 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 you're only 15, you know, and get paid? So, so their coach goes and tells the state athletic association. Oh man! Oh. Yeah, so they, they write a letter and come. They, they they almost they wanted to suspend the school and me for a year. Oh man! Oh, my dad was so hot. So. Um, Anyway, Nick, Nick Gula said it was just an exhibition that I never got paid. So yeah. they bought that and they said, don't, don't do it again. So that's my highlights of my first match. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good story. Man. So, Didn't have <laughs> so in 77, you're working for Gula's and you actually work two guys that are very popular topics on our show during this little quick early run. You work Gypsy Joe, obviously, and you work Arvel Hutto, who's one of our favorite people, much like you are. You know, I would love to hear some stories, especially about those first matches, especially with Gypsy I, Joe. I, I don't recall any of them. Okay. I don't recall. But I do have a good story with Gypsy Joe. Um, Please, yeah. Uh, Gypsy Joe had a reputation for chopping hard and beating guys up, you know, especially on a, on an independent show. Yeah. So uh, I can't remember the year, but um, I'm I'm lifting weights. I'm jacked up. I've been to Japan and all over. So um, I go to this show and I'm booked against Gypsy Joe. Okay. So all the guys come out of the dressing room they want to see what's going to happen yeah right they want to you know yeah so gypsy joe treats me with kid gloves he <laughs> kid, they were so damn disappointed <laughs> i had a great match with it you know they know how gypsy was right but, right yeah so that, that's, that's the only thing i recall Wonder why he did that. Do you just think he just respected you, or was it just? Yeah, he didn't. He he, he knew he'd be in trouble if he started that with me. Fair enough. Yeah, I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, okay. I, I, 
sounds braggadocious, but it's the truth. You know? At that point, you had built a reputation, and people kind of knew and, the deal. Yeah, and, and and he and and plus he 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 respected me and he respected my work, so he wasn't going to try anything. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Orville is a nice guy. Yeah, I met Orville and Bobby. And my dad would go with him to Huntsville, Alabama, every Friday night. Mm-hmm. He, um, Bobby Eaton and Orville w- were with a guy named Bobby Lee, Bobby, no, Bobby D. They put up the ring, and that's where I met Orville, a little redheaded kid, and 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 he and Bobby um, would always be there. And they tell the story that Bobby D would get them out of school and take them to spot shows to to, to put up the ring. <laughs> <laughs> that's, and that's, or, Orville was such a nice boy, you know. And mm-hmm. so he's great. He's a great human being. He's a great. He's, and I, it's a shame he never got a break. But um, yeah. I, I think it was because of his body. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. I've heard that maybe he wasn't as outgoing as as you know. He, yeah. Well, neither. Well, neither was Bobby. Right. Bobby, exactly. Bobby. Bobby got put in a situation, and he was a great worker. And I, th- I think Orville probably could have been, you know, uh, mm-hmm, but he, mm-hmm. yeah, I remember um, uh, a guy named uh, Big Guy, uh, Mosca was his last name. I can't Angelo, remember. Angelo, was it? Yeah, he came in with Ole Anderson to uh, Birmingham one time and said, uh, who am I working with? And they told him Orville Hutter. Who the hell is Orville Hutter? Who is this piece of... And I remember Randy laying, Orville Hutto is a nice human being and you're a lucky big son of a bitch that you get to wrestle. I remember Randy Randy let him have it or, or, over Orville. Yeah. So that's, I, that's my story there. Yeah, I'd heard that Mosca was a bit of a bully in some instances. So. Oh, yeah. Randy, Randy let him have it. It was good. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that's horrible is a nice human being, and he's doing a job for you, and you're just lucky, you know. <laughs> Dude, that's huge for Arvel too, man. Because I mean, that's you know, that's got to feel good for him to know that for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. Took up for him. Yeah, Randy Randy liked him. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So it looks like maybe around 78 or so you you went through Memphis. Were you just making the rounds kind of, or were you just, you know, just getting uh, work? I, I had a short, during the summer, it was just uh, a, a, sh- a short run, and I, and I went back to teach in high school. Mm, you know, there, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I wasn't ready. You mm. know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I knew a little bit, but I wasn't ready. Gotcha. I didn't get ready until about, I don't know, 79 or so. Randy, uh, we were real good friends. He took me up to Lexington and ICW. Yeah. So started yeah. producing. At the TV tapes and I got, I got to work every night and I worked with good, you know, Randy, Bob Orton, Jr. You know, Pez was there, Ronnie Garvin. Yeah. There was, wow. there was a lot, of, there was a lot of good workers and I'm wrestling every night here. Here's my first match with ICW that they, they, they let their tape run a little. We went to this little town called Sawyersville. Mm-hmm. There's four people on the card. It's probably the only one ever me, uh, Angelo, Randy, and, um, Lanny. Okay. So, uh, I think I, I don't remember who I wrestled first. Angelo, and, I think, I think. Yeah. And then come back in, uh, and then probably, uh, no, nah, it would, might've been Randy. So, okay. And then, okay. Uh, then, and then they have another single Lanny and Randy, and then we come back in a tag. Right. So there's yeah. only like three. So, you know, it's not much of a card. Right, right. So Randy has this idea. Says, well, you think you could beat some of these people here? And I said, yeah, I think I can. <laughs> so we, we make an announcement. Anybody who wants to challenge me for one takedown. Wow. One, that's our one takedown. So um, Lanny refereed and, you know, he made them take their belts off and check you know, if they had anything on them. So we just went to take down and I, I beat all five of them. It was <laughs> like, it, it wasn't a big, ha- Ra- Randy gave me a hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it made the crowd happy. You know, that, that, that was the first match. That's wild. And I mean, you, you don't I, know who you're going to get. <laughs> no, but I figured I could take them down real quick. And then sure. they, of course go again, but no, you know, next, 
Right, uh, right. I first started, came up there, Randy couldn't wait for me to cut. Him and Rip were going to this gym in Lexington, and the manager there was bugging them, you know, about wrestling being fake, and he wanted to wrestle them, you know, to see what they could do, you know, and they, they kept playing them off, and they, you know, the guy was, he'd wrestled in college a little bit, University of Kentucky. So I came up there, Randy says, well, here's a new guy. He doesn't know a whole lot. Well, if you want, you can wrestle him. So, um, I took him down and rubbed his face in the ground or, or the uh, carpet. And he had Matt Burns and that, that was the end of that. He was so happy. I, took up for it. I, I remember that well. That's awesome. I mean, what did the um, overall, this is just a general question, but overall, what did the Poffos really mean to you? Um, Lanny and I were good friends. We were part, Lanny was um, completely different in the fact that um, I, I was, he wasn't dangerous. He was just a nice, ha- happy go lucky guy. Wasn't a problem. Um, smooth as silk, you know, smooth as silk. Yeah, just, just, just a nice guy, and and he really kind of disliked his his brother and his father because they kind of ruined his life. And he, he would tell you they just dominated him. He yeah. was getting a little push in Portland, and they made him come back. You know, mm. he always yeah. kind of reminded him, you know, to to help him. Um, I got along with Ran- Randy for the for, for the most part. Um, Angelo was just well. What what happened with the, with the TV? Uh, in in my recollection, you know, he's just the TV station is your um, star. Yeah. So you know, I said, you know, we need to be bringing these guys a Christmas a bottle of wine or something, you know, some liquor, you know, just being nice to him. But he yeah. um, he'd argue, you know, you're wasting too much time. You know, we had two hours and it might take longer, and they might charge us more. And finally, he 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 come around with a stopwatch, trying to time things, you know. And I'm like, Angel, you we we can't do that. Oh yeah, we can. So he he got mad and he says he's gonna produce his own show you know uh so he buys some lights and uh, uh a camera you know that that's a reason there's a reason you do it in the studio you know it's a lot better so it it went downhill and i i kind of had enough you know yeah. i knew it wasn't going anywhere yeah yeah well let me ask you about some of these names because you know you did have a, an incredible tag team with lanny poffo and i i know i know you work with them later in mid-south and some other places <laughs> They, they they meant a lot that they they were all good teachers and they taught me about the business so my first big territory with bill watts is you know i knew what to do and how to wrestle i remember dibiase coming to me so man you can work welcome you know what i mean yeah so, yeah yeah they're happy to see you you know yeah. so there's a few names here doug vines and jeff sword you know you guys that's working not, them well that's randy was pissed at me because uh, I went to Louisiana and I was buddies with Ernie Ladd, who was doing the booking. Okay. And he asked me about some talent, and I told him that Jeff and Doug were good workers. You know, you'd like to have them, and so uh, I ended up getting them booked and coming to Louisiana. So okay. Randy was pissed and said, "You stole, you stole my talent." <laughs> you know, he was, "Yo, oh, you're on the." Um, the the wine grass click, you know, you left. Yeah. And yeah. I'll throw this at you. So he, he made threats that he was going to beat my ass whenever he met me, you know, for stealing his talent. And you know, it really was, I wasn't trying to steal. I was trying to help those guys because they were starving, you know, right. I wanted, I mean, Doug Vines made a thousand bucks his first week and he didn't know what to think. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and money. Yeah. Uh, so fast forward, I just, I'm from Daytona Beach, so I was there, and I didn't even know they were, WCW was having a pay-per-view, and I'm at a nice hotel across, at the beach, and they had the pay-per-view, and I, I'm I'm in the bar, mm-hmm. and it's crowded, and some of the wrestlers were there, and um, Steve McMichael comes over to the bar where I'm at, and I said, I'd never met Elizabeth. I knew who she was, that you know, Randy had met her at the gym. Uh, he really, he started his relationship with her after I left. 
Okay. okay. Oh, oh, and by the way, I got Lanny booked in Louisiana too. Right. So right. I, <laughs> so, uh, I, so McMichael says, well, why don't you grow some balls over there and talk to us uh, and drink? I said, okay. So I go <laughs> at the table with Bischoff and they can see me coming. Yeah. You know, so they're, they're turning their heads, you know, here comes a mark. Right. Right. <laughs> I got, and I said, hi, Elizabeth. My name's George Weingra. Ah, she jumped up and hugged me and everything. You know, that's the first time I really was, was introduced. She said, Randy is upstairs uh, shower and getting he's about to come down. I said, you can call him if, if you want. And I said, no, I'll wait for him. Cause, you know, he's going to beat me up, right? Right, exactly. So he, <laughs> he, he comes in the bar and I confront him. I said, well, do you want to... Um, bury the hatchet or do you want to fight right now and he said oh no man i'm cool i'm cool so that was <laughs> but we never uh kindled our our our, our relationship too much you know right he, right he on to, i was oh. i was ready <laughs> that, that would have been one of his lines are you ready to fight or do you want to bury the hatchet no man i'm cool i'm cool <laughs> <laughs> he's like that's my line man <laughs> yeah so and what about I, before we get away from icw too far because i want us to do an entire show about icw sometime and of course you're welcome mm-hmm. to be on that but who was radamia radamia radamias well explain uh, to me what yeah, that is or who that is. uh uh, how his last name? Um, oh, I can't. He was a real nice guy from um, Kansas City, and uh, the Papos liked him, and they asked him to come, and they wanted to use him. And he, was, he wasn't making no money. He was just basically doing jobs in Kansas City for a long time. So gotcha. they they made this uh, this kind of monster. <laughs> And, and he was, you know, he he was really ready. You know, he couldn't do a whole lot. You know, so they they pushed it, and basically, he might have drawn some before he started wrestling. Dang, I can't think of his name. But he was he he was his wife was friends with Judy Papo, and I mean, they they really got soured. They gotcha. Got soured and and they they totally left. Gotcha. Howard, okay. He was a nice guy. He was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, see, see, nobody knew him. There's no internet, um, you know, and nobody, no, you know, you could be in Kansas City and come somewhere else, and no, nobody know who you are. That's what they can paint his face up, and and nobody knew who he was. It's like okay. you, 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 you have no idea. Right, right. That makes sense. Okay, that makes sense. Very cool. And they got mad. Uh, Ronnie Garvin worked. R- Ronnie didn't dislike him, but if you don't fight back with Ronnie, he'll he will eat you up. You got to right. fight back. Yeah, and so, oh, you killed him, Ronnie. You know, you you know, we're trying to make this guy, and you just ate him up. And, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> That's that, great. Yeah, Doug, Doug Bynes said uh, Ronnie used to always beat me up. He said, but I fought back one time, and he sold. Then you just got to fight back. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's like those Japanese guys when you first get there, right? You fight back, and oh, they know. Yeah, yeah. We'll get I, to that I, though. I, yeah. So in '83, it looks like you go to Mid South. How was working for bill watts i i love bill was a good payoff guy you made money he was having sellouts everywhere the boys were happy um he he had a lot of strict rules but i think they were good you know you had to be in the dressing room an hour before you had to wear a shirt with a collar have your pants your shirt tucked in and uh you know, there were the only person who could wear jeans was Doug, and it was just gimmick. But um, right, right. I, mm. I I thought he I thought he was great. I loved Bill. He liked me. he brought. I called him to get booked, and I told him about my background, and he 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 booked me right away. I did some shooting for him. He had guys who come to his office and want to be wrestlers. So he said, "Oh, okay. Um, I'll let you wrestle one of the underneath guys." So after <laughs> the match, you know, he was. Everybody be gone. He get in the ring and referee, and I stretch the guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Bill, Bill liked me. Did any of those guys uh, stick around? What, what, what? Which guys is that? The, the guys, guys you would stretch. Yeah. Oh, they. Uh, I remember one of them. He had a manager, and uh, I, 
and, it, and the guy's trying to pull on his arm, trying to get him out of the ring. He's begging to leave, and I pulled off his shoes and his pants and everything. And <laughs> they, they, they ran the heck out of there. <laughs> it was cool. It was all the boys stayed after, you know, the Road Warriors, Ricky Morton. Yeah. Um, uh, Jimmy Garvin, they was all watching in the background to see what the stuff was going to happen. You know, Eric Watts told me and Wolfie about how he would be like, well, you couldn't even beat my janitor, and he would have somebody dressed up as a janitor, and he would, you know, tear him apart. So did you get involved, or was he, you just saying he was, here's one of my underneath guys, try him out. You know, right, right. I'm not going to put you in with the junkyard dog, because that right. would be fair. I'm going to yeah. put you in, and, I, and they're like, oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And then you got to work some great names there. Tim Horner, you know, Rip Rogers. I know that's a million funny stories with you, but Boris Zukov, one of my favorite guys. Uh, Uh, What a nice human being. He he really is. is. Yeah. Jim Nelson, that's his name. Right. Right. He's technically my wrestling grandfather because he trained the guy who brought me in the business. So, but anyway, I love Boris. Do you ever see him? Tell him I said hello. He's I will. Nice. Yeah. 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 I'll shoot you his number if you want to. So, you know, and I know you helped train a, a very young Barry Dorso during this time, right? I, well, I can't really take. Barry was with the Road Warriors with Sharky. Right. Right. He, Just kind of seasoned him. Well, yeah, he got smartened him up. He didn't know a whole lot. I remember having a, a TV match with him, and he had these little shorts on. He was Man Mountain Dar- Darso, and uh, I mean, he had me laughing. We got in the ring, and some this first man, somebody said, "Where'd you get them shorts at Sears?" <laughs> <laughs> George, I did. <laughs> was a human being. A real good guy. I trained um, for Grizzly Smith, um, Mike Smith, who was Sam Houston. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and I thought Sam is never going to make it. He's horrible. He's unathletic. But I guess uh, you know the the light bulb turned on one day. Yeah. Yeah. He have to be a good worker. The other guy was coming with him was. Um, did you know Dewey Robinson, the missing oh, link? The missing link. Yes. Yes. I'm with him, Jason. Jason was small, but he was very athletic, and he probably could have made it. He'd have made it today, you know, in those cruiserweights. Oh, yeah. weights. But yeah. he, he wasn't going to watch his territory. But he, what an athletic kid he was. Okay, yeah. Did he ever do Dewey anything Robinson, further at all? Or? No, not, no. not that I know. Gotcha. Dewey Robinson. What a character he was. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> uh, what an original character, too, man. Golly. Yeah. And he lived the gimmick, right? I mean, from what I understand. Well, I, I think he kind of was. Yeah. <laughs> he was out, out of it, you know. <laughs> I like him. And his wife, Gail. He yeah. never drove. I uh, always drove every. He said, well, she's part of the team. I wrestle and she has to drive. <laughs> <laughs> There's one team that shows up here in your history that I, I really am excited to talk about because you you worked with you tagged with guys Art Cruz you even tagged with your old partner Lanny against a very young Midnight Express Dennis and Bobby talk they, about those they, oh, they, uh, everybody loved to work with Bobby and it was a night off you didn't have to thank you they give you a good match it sell it was just they were super yeah uh, yeah. Magnum TA was, he was always excited about, oh, I get to work with with Bobby and Dennis. You know, it's so easy. Yeah. That's another, Magnum came in when I did, and he had come from Florida. Yeah. I I probably saw the show on him. Um, uh, But I remember him coming in, and he worked a few weeks, and we're on an airplane going somewhere. I'm sitting with him, and he says, well, this is my last week here. I, uh, they gave me my no- they gave me a notice. Ernie er- Ernie was through with him. He didn't have anything for him, so he was busy trying to call uh, Barry Windham and get booked back in Florida. Yeah. And lo and behold, a few days later, Watts said, "Well, maybe we can do something with him." And that's when he he teamed him up with Wrestling Two. So Wrestling Two was like his mentor. mentor. Right. Right. So he was. Um, so that, that, they didn't say any of that in, in the thing that, that, that he had, he had been let go. So that's how he got his first break. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 
Yeah, he's great. He's great. We had him on the show very early on, and he talked about that. And we've you've told this funny story before, George, about how him breaking in with Buzz, and he told us he paid him ten thousand dollars, and it's pretty crazy. But I think it was a little more than that. <laughs> Wasn't the story I remember him telling me? Maybe maybe I'm wrong. I don't right. think I'm, my mind's. But he told me that I recall that Buzz. He met him somewhere in a bar and told him not to talk to any of the other boys. And he would right. get him booked. Boys lead him down the wrong way. He came to his house. He wanted 25000 So uh, Terry told me that his parents put a second mortgage on the house. Man. Wow. Paid him. And then uh, so I used to tease uh, Terry. said, y- you paid more money than anybody ever to get in the business. But, but you're going to get your money back. Yeah, he <laughs> will. He did. Right, right. right. That that is something that is can't go unsaid. I mean, you know, he did make the money back, but so many guys don't. You know, yeah. And he was a Virginia State High School wrestling champ. Uh, I remember Lanny was always trying to try him and stuff in the dressing room, but he never. I I never wrestled him. You know what I mean? He just was. Yeah. He didn't want to go and take down. Neither one of us were were sure. And his wife, Tamara, then was real good friends with my wife, Rita. Okay, okay. He had bought uh, Tamara with him from Florida, and he had a little apartment, and he had a little teeny sports car. It wasn't a new one, a little white one. And he couldn't, he had to ride with other people because it only had two seats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that's, that's funny. So, that's, that's, yeah, he was go ahead. at an apartment bus with uh, Ricky and Robert. Uh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Now, yeah. And he had no money or nothing. You know, he was just yeah. just stuck down. Yeah. <laughs> so, let me tell my quick story with wrestling. Yeah, please. Uh, go go. Yeah, yeah. Wrestling two was working a um, a program with Jim Neidhart. So Jim's not real um, flexible. So he, Jim was doing jobs for him, and he in the finish what he'd roll them up. You know, if I'm, you know, push him in and roll him up and then, uh, and then two would sit on him and hurt him because he wasn't flexible. And he told them, don't do that shit anymore. Right. Uh, and so they had, uh, the last match was in Oklahoma city and he did it to him again. And Jim thinks he did it because he knew it was the last match. You know, when right. well, lo and behold, a couple of weeks later, we're in Lafayette, Louisiana. And Jim says, watch this. He goes out there. I think he told two to grab a headlock and um, duck, the, duck the elbow or something. He comes off. Neidhart just nails him and knocks him out cold. And my, my brother was refereeing it, so he had to go one, two, three, and took him a while to get him up. Wrestling two, come back to the dressing room. He grabbed his stuff and got in his car and left. He was not going to say anything to Jim. <laughs> Jim, Jim was, was a big yeah, Jim was a, a big power lifter. And, and he was a discus thrower? Discus thrower in color? Yeah. Shot put. Shot, or yeah. shot, or shot put. Yeah. Shot put. Okay. Um, I'm not sure which one, but he was, Jim was a friggin' stud. And I'd have yeah. to tell, Jim, loosen up. <laughs> and he didn't know he was hurting you. you know, but what I saw, he was very articulate. Um, he was smarter than you think. You know, he kept up with news and everything. He was. Yeah. Funny guy too, right? I, I gotta bet. get back. I, I, I'm sidetracking, but I, I was in Florida with him and Barry Darso, and they were teaming up. And this is, I was there when Eddie Graham killed himself. Oh man! Uh, Rick Rude and I were went to Orlando for a show, and then when we got there, they told him that he had shot himself. But anyway, um, yeah, there was no money. Yeah, they weren't drawing anything. It was dead. So they were on uh, a lo- what they thought, and it was uh, 800 bucks a week, guarantee. Yeah. So they come in. They tell, they, t- they tell me the story. They tell Eddie, um, we, we can't stay. You know, we need more money. And uh, we're, we're going, Jim's going somewhere else, and Barry's going to Minnesota. And he said, all of a sudden, she said, Eddie started crying said, no, you can't leave me. You know, I mean, uh, I'll take care of you later. He said he was crying like a baby. So they look at each other and they say, okay, <laughs> they'll stay. <laughs> those, those, those are stories you can't forget. Eddie was a, a great worker. Yeah. I, I 
and he puts his arm around me and he says, hey, kid, um, I'd like to make you some money. Will you bleach your hair blonde? Oh yeah, yes sir. <laughs> yeah, no, sir. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. man, what a what a legend in the business that guy was. Golly, man. Saturday, May the eleventh, twenty twenty four, the biggest pro wrestling event in Columbia, Tennessee's history. Mule Town Mania Fan Fest. Over fifty wrestlers from the past and present going to be there for the meet and greet from two thirty to five thirty. Also that night, TriStar Wrestling has a huge card already signed. Doors open at six for that. Bell time will be seven p. You're not going to want to miss it. A huge card already signed. Also, Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling will be in the house that night doing a Q&A with the Devils, the Wild Boys, and the Mortons from 4.30 to 5.30. Also, you have Kayfabe Cave. They're your toy collectibles and wrestling memorabilia dealers. They're going to be in the house. Also, we've got the Devil's Disciples. Mephisto and Dante will be there. The Wild Boys, Ben Jordan and Steve Neely. The Monster Forsaken. The Fox, Tony Falk and the LT Falk. The Morton Brothers, Steve and Shane Morton. The Smoking Buds, Cody and David Morton. Jerry Lynn and Virginia Morton. Hot Rod Biggs. Jeff the Crippler Daniels and Dominique will be there. Debbie Combs, Lady Superstar. Sunny Street will be in the house. Luscious Quentin Charisma. One Half of Booty Call, Brian Turner. Mad Max. Cowboy Billy Montana, Scott Spade and Mistress Misery, Superstar Mikey Dunn, DBSG, Johnny Bandana and Ryder Anderson, The New Era, Tavon Jordan, D'Amico Graves, The One and Only, Majestic, Mr. Entertainment, Yukon Jack, Yours truly, Pat Dooley, DJ R, Danny Pig, The Voice, Kane D, Pretty Boy Preston Adams, plus many, many more. The meet and greet will be $15 if you buy your ticket in advance, $20 at the door. TriStar Wrestling that night, $10 if you buy your ticket in advance, $12 if you buy it at the door. This is a huge night, Saturday night, May the 11th, 2024, in Columbia, Tennessee, at the National Guard Armory at 844 North James Campbell Boulevard. It's going to be the place to be for the best wrestling action around. Come and meet some of your local stars, some of your favorite people, some of your least favorite people from your past and present. This is going to be an opportunity that you're not going to want to miss. This is going to be well worth the price of admission alone just for the meet and greet. And then TriStar Wrestling that night. Biggest wrestling event ever signed in Columbia, Tennessee. So after Mid-South, I go... Bill Watts sends me to um, Texas for the Von Okay, Aaron. so world class. Okay. I was there for, uh, I'd say, a little over a year. And that was that was fabulous because the trips were short, longer ones. You could take a, a Southwest Airlines and it was like $39 one way, you know. Yeah. Dallas to Houston or Dallas to Amarillo. You can't drive your car for that, you know. Yeah, it was just, right. Mm. And they, they'd always have an hour and a half matches so that everybody could, could, could meet the last flight by um, 10 o'clock and get back. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. in it, it's 84 yeah. in world class and you put over yeah. Kamala and then four months oh, later, you're a, back for them. Is that true? A, no, I, I never left. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Never, Fair enough. Kamala, what everybody loved working with him. He was so easy, easy. And he was over. Oh man. What a prince he was. Yeah. It, it was, it was so good there. And they had it, this guy in the office, um, uh, Watt, I can't think of his, for Ed Watt. You come in and get your, they give you a sheet, you know, on the spot shows, the, the directions on how to get to the town, you know, how many stoplights when you get here and turn here and that. It was, it was so easy. Yeah. That, that's where I got with Gino and um, Jake the Snake and a bunch of people, you know, it was, I love that place. Yeah, no I, doubt. I, 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 have, have I told my story with Carrie in um, Thibodeau, Louisiana? No, we never got it on the air. So I would love to hear this story on the air. So, well, I met Carrie. He come over for weekends because he was so uh, the, the TV o- overlap. Mm-hmm. So we go um, from Baton Rouge to Thibodeau, which is probably an hour away, maybe less. And it's a, it's a. Uh, 
I don't know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar house. You know, it's packed in this old building, and there's, you know, you don't have the security's not good. But anyway, Carrie gets on early so we can get him out there. So I bebop out, and Carrie's right behind me, and you hear all this hollering, and I look back, and I, there was at least I know it's hard, at least three hundred girls on him. And oh my god! They were tearing his clothes off. <laughs> they had, had his pants <laughs> down, his shirt ripped off, his underwear trying to come, and he's just trying to crawl to get back to the dressing room. We get him back to the dressing room. I mean, it's like little ants. You like, yeah. you like the comfort thing. You, you, you think that that's cool, but it's not. It's scary. No, so no, yeah. Or police, so we could get out to the car, and it was hard to leave because they were blocking it. Oh, I mean, man. Anything like that, anybody over like that. That's like the Beatles uh, or Elvis, you know? <laughs> and all these young girls wanted a piece of it, you know? Just, oh. <laughs> man, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I, I said, it's good to be over, but not like that. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's good if one wants to rip your clothes off, but not four. Or yeah. Two, yeah. yeah. Maybe two. <laughs> Let's do two. Terry's <laughs> <laughs> probably three six four two hundred and sixty five pounds and he was chiseled but there's nothing he can do when that many people hunt yeah yeah you're made it's impossible yeah so talk to us about uh working buddy roberts you know he's the worker of the free oh, bird buddy roberts he was such a pleasure he was such a it was so easy um can i tell my buddy roberts and chris um chris the english guy chris yeah Adams. yeah I'm kind of new in the, in the dressing room. Is it okay to get a little bit dirty? Of course. Sure. Okay. So I'm just sitting there getting dressed. And Kevin Von Air, it's a, the old building in the sportatorium. <laughs> Kevin kind of comes out and says, guys, I just left the biggest shit with long, with a long turd. <laughs> buddy says, well, well, let me see it. So he takes the Buddy back. Buddy puts his hand in there and, reach, and pulls oh. the turd. And he, he comes back into the dresser and it thinks kind of long, but it's kind of dripping and some of it's falling off. <laughs> and Chris Adams is changing clothes and he's naked. And he comes after Chris, buddy, no, no, but no. And he chases Chris Adams all the way through the building, through the offices and everything, and chases him outdoors. He chased him outdoors with the turd. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, by, by, by the way, I, I like I listened to Mark Lawrence. I Maybe other people, you wasn't exciting, but, you know, I was there, so uh, I liked him. He was a straight-up guy, and I thought he's a great announcer. Oh, And he probably great. had more stories that he didn't tell. Oh, you I'm know. sure. Yeah, he's a very buttoned up, classy guy, and he, you know, but it, you know, man, he could tell some stories. But golly, you know, it's funny. We just had Brian Adias on, and that's coming out before this episode, and so it's already out. And he told a great story, and and he was telling a story about how when he turned on Carrie, that Mark was actually trying to like fight with Carrie, and he was like, "Get off me, you dumb Mark!" <laughs> he was like. <laughs> Can 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 he get your Iceman's number or is um is is Skip Young still alive? They've had they'd have good stories too. I'm not sure about Skip, but I I, I definitely think we could get Iceman. That that would be an incredible yeah. show. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I got stories with him and Rick Rue, but Iceman was funny. Yeah, I did. You know, you brought Jake up, but I did notice you worked him like four or five times in a row. It looked like. How was that? Yeah. Oh, God, it was so easy. He'd come and say, oh, God, I'm glad I'm working with you, George. All, all I'd have to do is just listen, you know? He was, <laughs> he, he was great. He yeah, was that's great. so great because he's a ring general, too, or he became one, and to know that he's was, listening to you. Yeah. I said, it's like, I mean, I liked, I got along with him. Um, Coco, beware. But yeah. Coco was, uh, it was like pulling teeth. You know, he's always, he's trying to get over and he's stiff and all that. You know, he's not a bad guy, but that's just how he was. You had the, right. it was a, a half-assed fight. <laughs> yeah. I loved working with Norval. I, when they would, I, I'd push um, Coco over to the corner and make him tag. I said, Norval, you stay in here. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the guys that you have to, it's a struggle. Yeah. The guys like or not, you know? Yeah. 
Reggie B. Fine told a funny story about Norvell Austin. He said, Norvell took me to his house and he had 10 little kids that looked just like Norvell. And he said, hey, uh, hey, Reggie, these are my kids. And he's like, I can tell. <laughs> 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 oh, man. So you do end up staying in world class. You work the Irwins. I mean, you had a great little run there, man. And, and some of that, I highly recommend you look at that up. I didn't want to leave, and the 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 guy that you like, and he's, he's probably a great guy. He came. Ken Mantel was the booker, but um, Gary Hart. What, yeah, he came in, and Gary was going to bring his own crew, and he gave me the notice, and I said, "Oh shit!" Mm. So that that's why I went to Florida. Man, okay, well, yeah. So that leads you to Florida. What was your connection to Florida? Was it just you built your name now, and you can get that job? Bill Bill Watts. Okay. Okay. Bill, Bill watched cold that called down there, got me booked. And so you were there during a very tumultuous yeah. time for championship wrestling from Florida. Did mm-hmm. you, what did you, did you notice a major, ch- I mean, obviously this is a dumb question actually, but did you notice a major change after the passing of Eddie? Well, it really, you know, Dusty was booking when I first got there, but he didn't last very long he was i was supposed to have a couple meetings with him but he you know he wasn't there when i went to the office and i said well i thought dusty was a good businessman and i said yeah he's a good businessman when it comes to him <laughs> 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 so they brought in uh the free birds and michael hayes was doing booking and so was dutch mantel they had great talent the free birds um of course dutch mantel barry darso nightheart um uh, who's, who's the killer B guy was there. You Brian know, Blair. They, yeah. 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 They, there was nothing wrong with the talent, you know, it just, I don't, I guess when Dusty left, you know, it just, it went to shit. It just was not. And then it was after I wasn't there very long when he, when he shot himself. So yeah. and Rick, and Rick Rude was there. I used to travel with Rick Rude too. So they had talent. Yeah. And yeah. then Percy, um, was managing them. Oh, wow. Really? So that's a crew, oh, yeah. man. That's an incredible yeah. crew. Yeah. There was talent, but they couldn't They couldn't draw anywhere. Man, 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 oh, man. It wasn't my fault. You know? Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you have any funny Florida stories at all that you remember? Or? Um, just, uh, just pissed off at um, uh, Horowitz. Oh, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Hor- I'm wrestling Horowitz, and... But this was later. I said, you know, and so I'm a nasty ass sheep. So, and I let him know. Um, and you know how the uh, the iron sheep would go act like he was spit and spit on. I told him, right. I'm gonna just I'm gonna spit on your body. Just, right. You know, like that. And then when you make a comeback, you you when and then you slam me. I want you to spit on me and get a pop. Yeah. So I spit on him. And he jumps up to make a comeback. You know, I'm a <laughs> stupid son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I tried so hard to get him to, um, I said, Gary, uh, you got the perfect gimmick. Put some Star David um, uh, on, on, your, on your boots and wear a yarmulke out to the ring. Yeah. And tell that, that, that you're Jewish. And the Jewish people are smarter than everybody. They run the banks. They have more money. And, you know, you're you're Jewish and you're smarter. You know what I mean? Look at you. And he says, no, nah, I don't want to make them mad. So I already got, uh, it's the pat on the back. <laughs> I said, God, I said, I said, Vince would love your gimmick, you know? Right. That, right. That would be a great, I said, let's just try it. Oh, no. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know who? <laughs> I mean, I thought that would be fantastic. You know, he, he had the name and everything. He could have yeah. he could have made made great interviews on how smart the Jewish people were. You know, and, and you guys all you you owe us money. You know, and, right, I mean, right, yeah. It, it was so just try it, and he wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, he, he did his thing and, and, and he's respected, but it's just funny that, you know, he wouldn't at least try it because that is a guaranteed gimmick that would either, they would hate you or get over, but, you know, and just think about it. It could have been one of the first 50, 50 gimmicks where half the people love you and half the people hate you, you know? So he, he, he could have really got, wouldn't have to do anything. You'd have heat just going to the ring. Exactly. Exactly. Finally, I love. He'd go in these hillbilly towns. It was great. He'd go out there, um, 
he goes to my and says, I got something to say to you hillbillies. Oh, <laughs> And then he'd, he'd walk to the ring real cocky. He'd get on the apron and he'd wipe his boots, you know, the bottoms. And then he'd grab the, and jump over the top of the rope. Mm-hmm. These were spot shows, but he'd do it on purpose. He'd catch his toe and do a flip into the ring. And they'd start laughing like hell. He'd jump, shut up. That's not funny. You know what I mean? And I'm dying. <laughs> <laughs> he was such an entertainer. No doubt. No doubt. Uh, yeah. So this guy, this guy just, uh, what a month ago, uh, hung up, hung up his boots finally, but you wrestled sting in UWF for Watts. Can you talk about that any, he, he was, um, you know, and I wrestled him in WCW too. Right. He was, yeah, he was always, he'd say, George, I don't, you just, you just call the match. He said, I'm tired. Just, just let me know what you want to do. And we'll do it. So he, he was, a, he was an absolute pleasure. Yeah, he was was an absolute play. He he didn't have an attitude or anything, you know. Yeah, let me ask you this. This is just an off the cuff question that we didn't plan on, but we actually did a whole episode on this back a, about a year and a half ago, where we said, "What if the Sting would have went to a WWF and Warrior?" Basically, they switched paths after Memphis. Okay, so. Mm-hmm. You know, Warrior goes to to Louisiana, goes up to Crockett, and then Sting goes to Texas. No, and then to uh, world class first. Right, Warrior right, goes. right. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I'm just saying, flip that around with Sting, his path after Memphis. How do you think that would have worked? Do you think Sting would have maintained and and gotten over like the Warrior did in the WWF? No, Vince liked the big strong guys. You okay. Know, and yeah. It, it, and he, and he definitely liked the physique, and and I didn't know the warrior, but I heard all kinds of he, you know nobody liked him, and he was a a real shitty worker and stiff. And I don't know if you heard the story. Um, Rick Rude beat the dog shit out of him in a dressing room in Georgia. Yeah, I've definitely heard that. And I just can't see I can't see the warrior getting over in Crockett like working with those guys would have run him off. I think no, they like to work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They, they they don't go go for that uh, a one minute match. O- Oli wouldn't have liked that either. Right. Dusty. Yeah. So it was it worked out well for him. It did. It did. Definitely. It did. Yeah. Well, that's cool. That's cool. I wanted your take on that. Go ahead, Jerry. Yeah, we'd always heard that. You know, um, you know, we'd heard from people that Sting, you know, in his career at a certain point when they split up as a tag team, Sting was willing to learn from people, and Warrior never was. That's what we always, always. heard. So. Yeah. He was what 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 a really nice guy. Steve yeah. Steve Borden is that his yeah. name? That, that's his name. Yeah. Yeah, he's a class act for sure. You know, was a tough guy was Rick Rude. He was the oh, road yeah. boy and Barry Dart said he was the toughest. Wow. They that's, said that's a big that, compliment. It is. Yeah. That is. And yeah. He would, uh, uh, I think a national champ in arm wrestling too. Right, he, right. It, it, he could go to bars and act uh, unassuming and challenging, you know, and somebody set it up, you know, you know, well, if you can beat this guy, you know, you can arm wrestle me, but I'll bet a hundred dollars. You can't even beat him. <laughs> 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 can you imagine going into that grandma B's bar that they all, oh, man. Very dark about yeah. that. and rude was vicious. He, his thumbs were all chewed up. Because he'd get behind guys and he'd rip their mouths. Man. Rip their mouths. Man. Yeah. Oh, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're my friend. <laughs> <laughs> hey, George, we've kind of fell down this, this rabbit hole, so I always like to ask this question if, if, if we happen to find ourselves here. You know, you hear people like Rick Rude are really strong. Uh, or tough and everything like that. And I've always heard Harley Race was real strong, tough. And and oh, people talk about Haku Ming as being real, yeah. real tough guy. Who do you think? Who do you think the toughest guy you've ever like been around in the in the business is himself? Well, the, <laughs> well beside yourself, George. Yes. No, I'd say um, Doctor Death, Steve Williams. Wow. wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he played football at Oklahoma and was second in the NCAA at heavyweight. And they don't give them things away, you know. No. <laughs> <laughs> I might have told Jimmy this that uh, when I met um, uh, Steve, I thought he was an asshole. You know, to be right. big cop, 
that. And a few weeks later, I said, Steve, I need to apologize to you. He says, for what? He said, uh, because I read you wrong. I thought you were jerking. You're a nice guy. He just <laughs> laughed. <laughs> he was a nice guy. He he was the real deal. Duggan was tough too. You know, yeah. Duggan was a state high school wrestling champ in New York. Mm. And he was, and he. My brother uh, was hired. Jim hired him to. My brother refereed. He hired him to, to drive him around, and uh, he'd go to the bars with him. And Duggan liked to get a few drinks, and and the guys went to challenge. He'd take a punch and then beat him up. Yeah. He, yeah. I got to tell this, my brother, I had him there uh, for watch refereeing. Yeah. So we're in Lafayette, Louisiana, and we go out once every two weeks, and it's uh, uh, on a stage, and it's like an auditorium. So you work the people just to one side. And so Magnum is in a real serious match with a Japanese guy that they were pushing, and, you know, he was karate, and you were getting blood, and he's in a real serious match. So my brother's refereeing, and all of a sudden, they're in a hold, and the people start popping, like you made a touchdown at the Super Bowl or something, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and nobody, they don't know what's happening, and so it happened a couple of times, right? They pop. So they get back to the dressing room, and they're like, why, why were the people popping? We weren't doing anything. What was that? And it, well, my brother reaches down, and it's pants are split and, and Eric, and Eric, never, Eric never wore underwear so he's got his butt to the audience and he's bending down and his nuts and everything is hanging out <laughs> oh my God. Why don't you ever go out there without underwear you know Corn, Cornette liked that story I think he was there <laughs> that's hilarious oh my yeah. god well, anyway, I was telling my brother, I was like, Jared, you're going to love George. He's great. I said, there must be some kind of peace being an apex predator. Like you might have yeah. you, a lot of the guys that are the baddest of the bad are nice guys. And just like you said about Steve, I'll say that about you, George. So that's him. That was- Ken, Ken, Ken Shamrock was a nice guy because he knew he could handle. Um, yeah, I like. Uh, like Buddy Landale, he'd always beg me, please don't put me in the sugar and hurt me during the matches. You know, and they they didn't try me. So my wrestling s- served me well. It served yeah. me well in fan because the young guys, they try to kick the shit out of you. And I said, okay. And I, I took one, Kawada, I don't know if you heard of him. He, oh, yeah, of course. I, yeah. Yeah, and I just went behind, took him down, put him in what's called a guillotine, stretched the crap out of him, and um, and I almost pinned him, and then I let him out. And he couldn't, and I told Joe Agusa, ask him if he's ready to work. I'll, I'll let him go. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's ready to work, and I never had any trouble after that. Those guys, they beat the shit out of anybody. They beat the shit out of the um, Moon Dogs. Yes, I've heard that. I'm, I'm, Terry Gordy said, guys, you got to fight back. And I said, they can't. Yeah. <laughs> they're not capable. And then they're hurt. They're limping around all bruised. They got the crap beat out of them. So but that big, was the young boy's job, you know, to, right, right. To, to weed them out. Well, you know, in Japan, it looks like you worked Jumbo really early. Jumbo Saruta, who's one of my favorite Japanese wrestlers. Yeah. Talk, uh, talk about Jumbo. I don't remember a whole lot. He was easy. He was... Um, uh, like the number two guy to Baba and then mm-hmm. um, Teneru was down. The the funny story with Teneru, I knew he'd been over here in the States, so I gave him an, an American match, you know, and uh, make him look great and let he sales for me and we go do the finish. And he sends word over with the referee. And I thought it was a great match. And he said, um, uh, Teneru, he didn't like the match. Mm. Mm. Oh. Mm-mm. So I said, okay, next time I wrestle them a few nights later, I just beat the crap out of them, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I hardly gave him anything. So then the match is, oh, I'm in my dress. He sneaks around the building, and he comes into the dressing room. And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> he comes over and puts out his hand and says, thank you. That's what I wanted. Wow. I said, oh, God. <laughs> but see, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Right. I thought he was gonna he's gonna beat my ass right there, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could have been doing that from the start. Thank you. <laughs> but I, I 
And then I worked with Baba and Wajima. Wajima was a, a grand champion in the sumo, and they were trying to uh, train him. Yeah. And he, and, and again, and Bob said, suplex him, do this and that. Well, hell, I can't. He won't move. <laughs> <laughs> I try. He'd get mad at me, so I have to suplex him. Because <laughs> he wanted to learn. And Tiger Man was a pleasure over there. Cool. Because I could do spots with him. You know, he liked yeah. Someone, someone that could that could do spots. So, um, yeah, it was. A, it's a different situation, you know, and you have to get used to the people. Not uh, if they like something, they might applaud. You know, they're they're getting a little bit better, but it was like I said, the, some buildings there'd be ten thousand people or more, and it was quieter than it is in my room. You know, so right, right. People, uh, and the other Jataki Jet Singh would come out that he made me his part, and, and he'd have the saber. Um, sword and he'd be whacking the shit out of the fans. <laughs> <laughs> he said there's nothing about getting sued over here uh they don't do that and then i found that the philosophy is they like to be scared and their philosophy they want to face whatever they're scared of they think that brings them good luck okay mm. okay i see yeah we come come out of the hotel and to be the young boys there and he'd have this, and he just he'd chase them and whack the shit out of them. Just, <laughs> that, that's what they wanted. It, it, but I didn't understand that for a while. Yeah, that makes sense. Bob had a lot of spot shows that were bought by the um, uh, mafia. Oh. Mm. Yeah, we get to the town, and, um, and I wondered why they had these little vans with big speakers on them going around the little town advertising the show. I said, I didn't know Baba did that. Oh, Baba, Baba just say Baba sold them the show for 100000 or more, and so they, they can sell all the tickets and, and make the profit. Gotcha. So, so, so Bob, Bob, Bob liked that. Baba was connected, apparently. <laughs> well, they, oh, God, they... I, I remember I went out like 13 nights in a row eating sushi and drink and I was sick of it. I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then they take you to, um, what's called the boys call it. So bolas. Yeah. It's, uh, the house of ill repute. <laughs> and these, these were classy women. They'd bring you up there. Um, they would take you, your clothes off. They, they, they have a bar there. They give you a, a drink. They wash you off, and you do, you do whatever you want. And then they dress you again, or wash you, and dress you again, and you go down. I mean, it's like holy mackerel! This life is good. But yeah. the mafia, yeah, the mafia ran there. Yeah, mafia ran. And in the other good story, the mafia. You know a lot of them because the, some of their digits were cut off on their mm, fingers. Yeah, right. right. Mm, and, yeah. And, and when they messed up, they had to take a samurai sword and cut the digit off themselves. Oh my gosh! Yeah, mm. the tiger say, "Don't! I'm not going to hit one when I, if I see the they got a digit missing." You know what I mean? You <laughs> yeah. It, 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 yeah. You see the tattoo, so watch out for them. Don't make sure you don't go after them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding, man. What a world. No so kidding. I did pretty good for a poor little blind boy, you know, get to <laughs> these stories and get to do these things, you know. You did, I, man. I, I, I count my blessing, you know. You did, yeah. So you got um, a guy that, you know, first started in, he had some amateur wrestling background, uh, and then he went, tried sumo wrestling. How about John Tenta? You have any stories? Oh, about yeah. Him? He was there. He had, um, John had been doing the sumo, but what he told me, it was just, he was only going to go so far yeah. and that it, it was really tough to, to, to eat and be disciplined and do what they want to do. And then Baba offered him a contract and he started wrestling. So I wrestled him a lot and I always joked, I said, I never lost. He went to LSU and wrestled. I said, I never lost to a guy from LSU and I'm putting you over. <laughs> said, well, I never lost to a guy from Tennessee, but he was, he was good. That's he was awesome. On the Japanese side, big yeah. content. Yeah, what a nice man I've heard. What a nice man. He was, so, he yeah. was huge. 
So you eventually make your way back to America after your run in Japan. And then, you know, a lot of our listeners are in the in the Tennessee area and you started working a sheet gimmick. Now, when I was Omar Alcazan, everybody asked me if I knew George Reingroff. I'd heard your name a million times. Obviously, I knew you from the ICW days. But as far as that goes, I did not come to you and say, can I work this sheet gimmick? But that being said, when did you start okay. working that sheet gimmick? Um, Bobby, Bobby Fulton. Okay. Said, said I think you uh, you look like a sheik. You're dark complexed, you know, with a tan and all mm-hmm. that. Works and shows for me as a as a sheik. So he had been over to Syria and and he had the uh, the headgear and some of the stuff that he'd brought back for souvenirs. So Bobby Fulton's the one who gave me the idea and 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 the gimmick. You know, I wasn't going to make any money as Goody Two Shoes White Boy George right. Weingroff. Right. So it was just. And it, and at the time, um, that's when the, the Iraqi War and all that. So yeah. I could get, get Lawler to say on TV he, when he wins, he sends his sends sends his money home to to buy milk and food for the babies and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> right? That had to be careful. not not too much heat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because that could get nuclear. Yeah, and yeah. Then I would um, bring a little rug and I would um, do the prayers. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The USA. I stopped, you know, you know, so the the match was over. And I've seen matches in the with the Sheik gimmick where you've worked two of my favorite people in pro wrestling is Ben Jordan and Wolfie D. You work both of those guys as the Sheik. Talk about working a young Wolfie and talk about working Ben. Yeah, I remember Wolfie. Um, he he was very athletic and he was willing to listen to me. You know, yeah. what I mean, he was, yeah. A good student I'd never had, and he could he could do a lot of things. So he was he was easy. Ben had been working for a little bit, but um, Ben was very easy, and he's a real nice guy. Yeah, he was smart. He stayed. He kept his regular job, and today he has a pension from that. Right. Right, right. He'll be able to retire and, and live comfortably, yeah. and that's the point. Right. Yeah, Ben's such a class act. He he really is. I, yeah. I count him as one of my friends, and, and he's... And he had a really good body back then, too. He worked yeah. out to look good. Look good. Work work his butt off too, and I, he sent some pictures of you two working together. It's pretty awesome okay. to see. Yeah, I'll, I'll send them to you. Um, here to, yeah, it's it's incredible stuff. But so the sheet gimmick, as far as that goes, though, you the the whole point was is it's a timely gimmick, right? And you know exactly. how how long did you work that gimmick? I can't tell you. It wasn't it wasn't a great it wasn't a long period of time, but um, yeah, yeah, it was off. On and I could work in. I could work in independent shows, and I always learned that they'd always say, um, well, "Well, how much you got to have to come?" Yeah. Like, man, I would always say, "Well, how much does the job pay?" Right. So a mm-hmm. lot of times they would make me an offer more than I was going to ask for, and they were happy because they got to set how much they were. They weren't begrudging. Right. Right. That's yeah. But hard. yeah, does the yeah. job pay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's whoever okay. names the price first, right? That's the gimmick. Yeah. That's the, yeah. Yeah. And I learned the other trick in the dress. If you get your money and everybody wants to know, well, how much did you get? And I do a Johnny, I do a Johnny Carson, and put it to the great Carson. And I said, not as much as it should be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you touch it to yeah. your head. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so in 93, you work in Smoky Mountain. You work Tracy Smothers, a, a guy we uh, talk about all Tracy. the time. Talk yeah. about Tracy. Tracy, uh, he ran Springfield High School in, uh, here in, in Nashville, not too far, away, but he was a real good guy. Yeah, and was yeah. was a good worker too. He had a lot of charisma. Great. Yeah, I was I, I was good friends with him. Yeah, I, and I knew his coach, you know, in, in high school. So he was a good, real good guy. Yeah, and I don't. I think he passed away just recently, didn't he? Or a few yeah, years a few ago. years back. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, he had a lot of health problems. Yeah. Know, yeah, I heard he was working through him. He couldn't hardly walk to the ring and he'd still get in there. And, and I heard he didn't have any boots. He'd wrestle barefooted, you know? So yes, he would. Yeah. I don't yeah. think he had any skills, you know? And that's, that, that, that's a shame. He was a nice guy. Tim Horner was like that. I think 
corners like a um, alderman or something in the city he lives in. I think you're yeah. right. I think you're right. He did try a singing career. Did you ever hear Tim Horner oh, sing God. Shameless? I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's Tim Horner singing, so we'll just go with that. I don't I don't yeah. Say, yeah. And then I saw you work in WCW, you work Cactus Jack, and you actually tagged with another friend of ours, Bob Cook. And talk about I guess that time were you just kind of winding it down at that point? Nah, I just I just I just went in to do T V and um this was funny. Um Cactus Jack he used to wear the the little crop top things that he worked in, you know, the mm-hmm. Uh, it's kind of cut low on your chest and in the sleeves and all that. And I, w- I was wearing one when we were talking over something. He said, George, you're not going to wear that in the rain. And I said, well, hell no. I work out too hard to wear that. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I never get that. Yeah, he was worried I was going to wear that and look like him. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember much about Bob Cook at all? No. Yeah, yeah, he was a Florida guy. He worked underneath a lot. Yeah. But Bob's Bob's a good guy. He's a heck of a. Yeah. He's got a really good punch for a Florida guy. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Most of the Tennessee guys are the better punchers, but um, I don't think so. They're the, 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 my dad would call it the Tennessee stomp. You know, they just okay. The at you, you know, he says, "Oh, it's a shit." Okay. Well, who who do you think? <laughs> what who throws the best punches? Ronnie, Jerry, Law, Jerry Lawler throws a great punch and he barely touches you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Randy could throw a good punch. Bob Orton Jr. could throw a punch, good. R- Ronnie could throw a good punch, but he'd lay it in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so no wonder it looked you know, good. <laughs> but Sawyer, you know. Uh, uh, Sawyer, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Throwing so, a stiff punch. Did you ever notice this about Ronnie? Now, I don't ever proclaim to know what this is about but jake the snake on his podcast says that when ronnie garvin goes for the comeback his nipples get hard (laughs) have you ever noticed (laughs) (laughs) and i I hate that he he knocked his father so bad and um right my, my relationship with grizzly and i talked about it with my brother i had a great relationship i never seen any of that stuff and um he was I can only say what what my relationship was. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, no, that and makes it's sense. Not, I, Sam Houston, Mike Smith would never knock him. You know, he, he right. loved Grizz. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's yeah. Who knows? But, uh, that is Jake's story. <laughs> yeah. He didn't like. He did not like him. Yeah. Yeah. But well, I can't see Jake telling him, you know, you're a piece of shit and you're no good because he used to brag about Jake to me in the car, you know, He's proud yeah. of his son. man, I didn't, I didn't see that. So. Gotcha. But then I'm not his son either. So. Well, there's some disconnect there somewhere. Not sure what it is, but yeah. yeah. Jared, we always pivot to you for our last question. Go ahead. <laughs> George, this is probably going to be tough for you. Cause there's a, uh, you've had, um, thousands of matches, but if you can think back on like a match, you just thought, man, that, that, that feels like it was my best match ever or my favorite match I, I ever had. I had a few, um, uh, our Broadways with, with, with Randy. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And that, that, that's not easy to do, no. but it was so, I, I just, I just listened and his timing was good. So, uh, I had good matches sometimes with Bob Orton Jr. When, when he wanted to work, he was not always consistent. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, I yeah. see who else was a great work. You didn't have to do anything with Gino Hernandez. Yeah. Um, okay. He didn't do a lot, but, but he, he had good time and, and he could get over, uh, buddy, but buddy Roberts is another one. He was a pleasure. Okay. Okay. He, he always had he, but Rand, Randy's got to be my best matches. You know, very, when he very won. cool. Yeah, man, that's that's a hard one to beat. Was Randy? I've I've, I've heard this, and I'll ask it to you again. I've asked other people. People say that Randy was always in that macho man character. Like he never hardly broke character at all. Is that is that true, or did you see him uh, out of the character a lot? No, he wasn't that way when we're riding in a car, or you know, we're in the a studio or talking or we, we go to the gym together or we go out to a bar where we're girls and all that. He wasn't, I mean, but he, he probably was for about 
most of the time, but gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. I, 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 I've always seen another side of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good I, to hear. That's good to hear too. Definitely. I just recently saw a match that he and Hogan were tagging and this was in WCW and he and Hogan were tagging and to wake Hogan up out of a stupor to get him to Hulk up, Macho Man goes up on the top rope and drops an elbow on him to wake him up. (laughs) (laughs) That that elbow would be really stiff. So, uh, but you know, it it was hard to work it. So I knew to kind of, kind of, uh, get edge up a little bit so I, so i'd have a little room because he yeah he he could he could hurt you if he if he but you know what he was hurting himself worse than, than you because it's him oh yeah, the oh, yeah no doubt. you know yeah. when it's not a good ring you know he was yeah. he was that's not that's not a good finish because you're going to get hurt doing it yeah yeah no joke and you kept in touch with lanny right throughout yeah your, yeah i yeah. talked to the week before he passed away, you know, Man. he was going to New York. He was he living did, down uh, in Ecuador, right? He was, and he had went up to New York City. He had a agent had him autograph session, and he always wanted to go to um, one of those Broadway shows. So the agent, after the signing, took him to a Broadway show, and they went out to eat. And he comes, you know, he's all happy and everything, I'm sure. And he goes to sleep in the agent's bedroom. Next morning, they um, make breakfast and they go to knock on the door and no answer. And they finally go in and um, he had a heart attack in his sleep. Mm-hmm. But hell, that's the way to go. You yeah. Know? No hospital bills, you know, no aggravation, you know. And he was lucky for the family because they didn't have to go to Ecuador. They could uh, right. cremate. Took him to um, Chicago and buried him in a mausoleum next to his dad. Nobody else wanted to be buried there. <laughs> and Randy didn't want to be buried there either. So Lanny said, oh, okay, I'll take it. But, you know, I didn't have to go through the trouble of going to Ecuador. Yeah. That, you know, he's kind of a, um, a minimist. He didn't have a lot of stuff, you know, living down there. He didn't have a lot of clothes or anything. But he had some workout equipment in his place so uh i think that he he bought a condo right on the pacific ocean that was uh like two bedroom right over the pool it was gorgeous for a hundred and five thousand dollars wow man he kept That's trying amazing. to get um, the, the food is good there and um he loved it and all the girls loved him because they thought he was a rich gringo so he, <laughs> he, he in a toilet seat down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my son's grandmother lives down there and she has extended her social security very far because of that. So it's yeah, it's, he, Lanny, Lanny was a little through he said he couldn't spend it all. He said he could if he wanted to, but he, he generally didn't even spend his check. Yeah. And then Lanny Lanny had money, so Right, right. He he was very happy those last years down there. That's good. That's good. Happiness is all you can ask for before you go, you know. And he so. had so many girlfriends. He was like, wow. He was in Tampa the last few years, and I don't think he got laid for a few years. <laughs> 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 yeah. oh. They all thought he was a wealthy gringo. So. <laughs> uh, That's a good so. gimmick to have, you know. So Yeah, well, that, yeah, they don't see that many Americans, you know. Yeah, Take yeah. He said the food was, the, if you like seafood, it's so fresh there. He didn't even have to have a car. He said an Uber sounds like two bucks to go anywhere, you know? Wow, wow. Thick, things were close. Man, that's awesome. The only awesome. thing that was bad, you couldn't buy TVs and cell phones and, you know, um, things like that because they come from the States. But, you know, you know clothes or food or anything else, you know, is, is relatively cheap. Now, he did lose his phone. I, did, I lost contact with him for a a few weeks that he was walking down the road and a guy on a motorcycle uh, drove right by him and snatched his phone. Man. He wasn't there. He said, Man. I tried to check him, but that was stupid. He was gone. <laughs> right, he was gone. Yeah. Yeah. And I was worried about, you know, somebody robbing him. But he lived at a, a gated place. So Gotcha. You know, okay. He, yeah. He never, never had problems. For 105000 That's amazing. It was gorgeous. Yeah. It was Absolutely gorgeous, man! I don't even so, know if you can afford a shoebox for that in the states. You know, no. <laughs> and, and, um, his his daughter got everything. Gotcha. Um, I I haven't asked him what he's 
for what how much you got, but I'm I'm sure sure I talked to um Sally's ex wife. But uh but the first thing his daughter did was she's made, she bought a brand new house, a big one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Your house is just fine. You don't need to do that. You know, he wasn't gonna yeah. give her the money to do that. <laughs> and as soon as he passes, it's in a big house, man. Oh well, yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, her, this is um when I seen her a few years ago, um, and longer than that, but I went to her house, talked to her, and mm-hmm. she says, to me, I was shocked. Um, well, first, got to tell you, she didn't know. She bought a house with her husband right next door to where Randy used to live and rent a house. Wow. She said, my Randy lived there. I said, yeah. What's the, what's the odds of that? That is but, a million and one. I mean. Yeah. And she didn't. And uh, her mother, Sally, didn't remember yeah but i i remember going to the office and over there but she said to her she says my uh grandfather angelo was a prick <laughs> I said, well he, i didn't want to say well he was but right no surprise. yeah they she went through hell on the she said sally said she felt like she was divorcing angelo not randy because he oh. made it took her car insurance and everything from her and made it real tough you know and her and her mother it's kind of yeah, like she was my, leaving the family. They were going to tax her real big before she did. Oh, they, yeah, they, they, a- Angelo was vindictive. Yeah, man. Very much so. Did you see that in Randy or Lanny at all? Um, Lanny wasn't, um, Rand, R- Randy I- idolized his father and I could see where uh, he would take his father's advice and he would, he, he would go no matter what, you know, his yeah. father was what, what was his idol. Yeah. But but Lanny had a had different thoughts, you know. Yeah, yeah. He, he was more of his own man, his own his own man. Rather. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Well, George, right, I tell you, this has been a pleasure. Story, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll just do a part two then. How about that? <laughs> well, let, well, let, well, let's wait a while. All right, we'll take some time. Yeah, you, you know how to build it up. I like it. So <laughs> we thank you so much, George, for coming on. It really is an honor to have you, sir. You, really. You didn't have to lead me a lot, did you? No, <laughs> no, you no, led sir. us, man. You led us. <laughs> <laughs> Just shut up and listen, right? Well, there you <laughs> go. Well, send me a link to this. We will. Would you, would you, are you, yeah. Right, yes, well, sir. Thanks for having me. Thank you, George. Take care. Thank you, George. Right, Great talking right. to you. All, All right. right. All right, that was George Weingroff, and we will be right back to wrap things up with the Plastic Chic on Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling. Join me, Gene Jackson, for the Jackson Interaction Podcast, where I'll be doing one-on-one interviews with people from the world of professional wrestling, as well as stand-up comedy. You can get them anywhere podcasts are available in both video and audio form, but you can find them all at genejacksonpod.com. This is your rock star ring announcer, Aaron Camaro. I'm a man who believes the two greatest art forms ever created are professional wrestling and heavy rock music. So when I'm not hosting the best parties that also happen to be live professional wrestling shows, I'm hosting the Decibel Geek Podcast. Decibel Geek is a weekly podcast that features discussions of all things rock. We're talking the Beatles, the Stones, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, Black Sabbath, Kiss, Ozzy, Motley Crue, Guns N' Roses, Metallica, Alice in Chains, Pantera, and everything in between. Plus, we'll turn you on to new bands from today that have the same spirit and style that the legends do. Decibel Geek is hosted by myself along with Rockin' Pod founder Chris Sinzak. And each week you'll get interviews with famous musicians and industry insiders along with informative, entertaining, humorous, and insightful discussions and most importantly, a passion for the music. So if you love to rock out as much as I do, then this is your invitation to the greatest rock and roll party in all of podcasting. It's Decibel Geek, and it's available right now on all major podcast platforms. Oh yeah! Oh! 
Oh, Sheik, one more great episode. George Weingroff. Wow. What a great story. What a great guy. I, I just, I think the world of that guy, he's the, he's one of my favorite people, honestly. You know, I, I'd listened to the episodes. He was on the Wolfie D show with you all and thought, man, he's just such a natural like guest. It's like a pleasure yeah. to have him. And, and yeah. he did, he didn't disappoint at all. So no. And he's honestly, maybe a, a mind reader because every oh, question, seriously. We would go to, I mean, it was like we would have it and I would almost be like, do we stop him and then ask the question and stuff? So we just kind of let him roll on stuff. But it was funny when we would go back, you know, like, hold on, let's go back to Pez Watley or something, you know, yeah. and, but it was not that it was just because he passed it up. And and he it, it's like, man, that guy's just got so many great details and great stories and, and remembers them. And, you know, just such a just such an honor to have him on the podcast really is very very happy and I'm, I'm glad to call him a friend because man you know in a fight george weingroff's one of the guys you definitely want to call a friend <laughs> yeah shooter <laughs> that's a lifeline and a friend right there so yeah absolutely man he's yeah he's uh you know i i, I wanted to ask him and i kind of just got lost in 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 him talking there i wanted to kind of ask him if uh you know what what his thoughts would have been like if with MMA or something like that? I mean, he's got the talent and everything like that. It's, it's yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, he was a little older at that time, forty one. Right. Yeah, you know, he was forty one and he did Pancrase, in which that was just essentially a work shoot. But yeah. you know, he went to Japan and did that, and literally allowed that guy to kick the crap out of him for a whole match because they told him it was work. So, but yeah, that would have been a different match had that one not. But if you you know I, it, w- it would be interesting i just think he maybe just was a little too old for that at the oh, time yeah. that that it came it's around very, but yeah very possible it, it just it just crossed my mind and i was like well it just it just didn't ever hit right to ask him so i was like well, yeah yeah we'll just go by it <laughs> One question, and we can get it on part two for sure. I wish I would have asked him, you know, like, who are some of the shooters that he thought of, you know, like, who are, you know, know. it's all good. We, you know, got a great episode out of him. And honestly, it just flew by. It just felt like it was no time and it was already done. And I was like, holy cow, we're at the end of our questions here. It's already at the favorite match. So, yeah, 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 absolutely. It's a, again, great stories and. Um, he, I'm sure he could have went on for hours if we, if we, if we it just steer the, steer the ship the right way a couple of times. So, yeah, no, he, he, he's great, but we'll get him back on and You know, he, he's a, he's a podcasting gold. Like I said that about Jamie Dundee, George Weingroff is absolutely podcasting gold. You know, while your guys are on Facebook, looking at our group at GMBMPW or our page, one I got to recommend is of course, memories of gentleman Saul Weingroff. And it's got all like all the stuff about his dad, Saul and the family and just cool stuff. And you you got to go follow that group, and, you know, be a part of it. You'll learn some stuff. You know, I, I, we could do a whole episode on Saul, you know, get some people on and have some conversations about Saul. But, you know, go join that while you're there looking at GMBMPW. Make sure to hit that memories of Gentleman Saul Weingroff. And then also we're on YouTube. We're on X. We are on Twitter, whatever you want to call it. Instagram. Follow us there at GMBMPW. While you're there, go to at Live Wolfie D and give that show a follow. You know, we're we're putting stuff out all the time, uh, extra stuff, reels, clips that you know you can hear only in those places. So if you're not following us, you're not seeing those those cool clips and shorts and reels and all that fun stuff. We we're doing some fun stuff over there. So go follow us at GMBMPW at Live Wolfie D and for sure memories of Gentleman Saul Weingroff for sure. Go join that group as well. So yeah, right. but other than that, I don't have anything else. Do you? Oh man, I, I'm good. It's well, good. 
We've got a good one booked for next episode, and that's our buddy Buzzed Up. This one has been one that's been a long time coming. He's a funny, 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 funny man, so you'll enjoy that one. I, I can't wait to hear some of his stories. He's just one of those guys that everybody wants to hang out with in the locker room because he's so funny about stuff, and you know all the guys that we know respect him, and, and I do too, and it'll be fun to have him on, and, and I, I'm, I've got him booked already, so I know we can count on that one so <laughs> yeah absolutely man it's uh let's keep doing it all right well that's what i like to hear and for george weingroff the plastic chic jared street i'm jimmy street and this has been give me back my pro wrestling we'll see y'all next time don't forget shoot up with a tear in my eye <laughs> this is the greatest moment in my life This has been a James Rock Street production.